we're going to do a kind of a two-part presentation. I'll do the first half, and Kira's going to do the second part. This is some research that we're doing sort of along the lines of Brent's work on trying to develop low-cost methods to estimate ammonia emissions from livestock operations. Like I talked about this morning, we all have, as researchers, we all have these super expensive, hard to operate equipment. It's not going to be a lot very helpful for researchers and, or producers that need something more continuous out there uh, that allow them to identify ammonia hot spots, see how trends and things like that in their ammonia uh, measurements. And we just didn't want to measure concentration. We actually wanted to measure emissions. So the objectives were to adapt these diffusive samplers that a lot of folks have been using to, to do conditional sampling. And what I mean conditionally is mean they don't sample all the time. They only are exposed to the air when we have winds coming from a certain direction at certain speeds. And we wanted to test this at feedlots and dairies. And then we wanted to estimate the pin uh, source uh, ammonia emissions using an inverse model. So we are using these radiello diffusive samplers or passive samplers that are widely used these days. They're used in the AMON network. They're inexpensive and simple to use. The problem with deploying a continuous sampler at a feedlot is that the, it's, it's cumulative and it, as we all know concentration is strongly affected by wind speed. So if you get really calm winds at a feedlot, you can just have a cloud of 3,000 ppb ammonia just sitting there hanging out over your sampler for hours on end, saturating the inside of the sampler. Or if the wind's blowing from the other direction, you get a completely different result. So it's different than just doing some um, ambient monitoring out in the cornfield or up in a forest or somewhere. So you need a way to conditionally sample only under certain conditions. This is how the diffusive samplers work. There's an internal acid cartridge and air just diffuses through a diffusive barrier at a known rate. I will point out we're not going to talk about it in this presentation, but we did a bunch of calibration of the radiellos at the concentrations that you find at livestock operations because they weren't really developed to work at those high concentrations. And the factory calibration does not work okay, at livestock operations. It has to be adjusted. So we developed a, a, what we call a conditional sampler. It's a robotic mechanism, again, that only exposes the cartridge under uh, if the wind's above a certain wind speed, it's the wind direction's in a certain arc, and it's a certain time of day. And we developed lots of different versions of this that use a wireless sensor network, uh, again, using meteorological data to decide when to deploy them and when to retract them. You can see one here in the lower, the, you can see the diffusive samplers here in the robotic mechanism or actuators. Basically, they're sealed inside of a tube. Then the controller decides that where their conditions are acceptable and it extends them out the bottom of the enclosure to take a reading. Here's one that's deployed. Here's one that's sealed in the tube. This just shows a little bit of the engineering. There's been a lot of really nice developments in these low-cost actuators that you can control with pulse width modulation. A lot of really nice low-cost electronics making that all possible. And we've worked on the design. It, it, we do include a Hall effect transducer. So we don't just assume that it was deployed when we told it to deploy. We actually independently check to see if it, the actuator actually extended. And this is important. Again, one of the reasons we're also working on this technology is thinking about that producers uh, may be faced with more regulatory constraints around ammonia. Uh, and uh, they're going to have to maybe do property line monitoring. And these are the kind of tools that they might be able to use. So you need to have some way to for quality assurance, quality control. We're also using these really low cost uh, electronics, these open source things like the Arduino. Okay, those of you that some of you might work with that, uh, a lot of hobbyists use it, a lot of students are using it. There's really just a tremendous amount of exciting things going on with these low cost microprocessor boards. You know, our group, when we used to try to do stuff like this, we had to get engineers to work with us, electrical engineers, to program all our microprocessors and that type of stuff. Now we can do it all ourselves. Uh, it's pretty exciting, and it really r makes the uh, prototyping and research go much faster. These just show some photos of some of our systems out at feedlots and dairies. We, we set them up downwind and upwind of the areas that we're interested in, uh, and oftentimes we're comparing them to um, more research-grade equipment that you see here on the right. 
Uh, sometimes we have one weather station that controls all the nodes on, in a wireless sensor network. We use that using the XB modules from Digi. Sometimes we found that it's better just to have an independent sampler, which is the one on the left. It's completely self-contained. It's not uh, being controlled by a, a central unit. So we do this weather-based sampling. Basically, the systems know what the wind speed is at the site. They say if it's above a certain level, right now we're using 1.4 meters per second because that's what it takes to get turbulent conditions at the site. Uh, then it checks the wind direction. The wind direction's out of the right direction. And if it's in the time of day slot that we're interested in, uh, it'll go ahead and extend the sampler. Otherwise, it retracts it. At a lot of our sites, when we, we leave them out for two weeks at a time, and many times it meets the weather requirements three and a half to four days out of the 14. Okay, so maybe one day it samples three or four hours out of the day. The next day it might sample eight hours out of the day. Uh, then there might be a day when the wind's from the wrong direction. It doesn't sample at all. So you get this intermittent sampling based on weather conditions. Then, of course, we after two weeks, we ret retrieve this, uh, the uh, cartridge take it in and run it through our IC and find out what the time average ammonia concentration was over that period. We've tested them at both dairies and feedlots. This is, we typically set them up like this, just uh, schematically, where you have one on the upwind side and several on the prevailing downwind side. And sometimes we, like the last speaker, we set them up at different distances from the, from the edge of the feedlot. And this just shows some example data uh, the ammonia concentrations, look how high they are. This particular feedlot has some of the highest ammonia concentrations we've ever measured, and we've worked at quite a few. And we're still trying to understand why this particular yard has some pretty, really high concentrations. But you notice that we see some positional variability and positional trends. Look at that north station that we label north. No matter what the date is, always higher than the other stations. What is it about that part of the feedlot that has higher emissions? Some are always a little bit lower. And uh, uh, the background concentration at this site's running about, oh, 15 to 20 ppb. Okay, so, you know, if we had the background on here, you'd, be, you'd barely be able to see it. So there's a lot of emissions coming off feedlots, but we've already <laughs> established that, I think, today, that feedlot, beef feedlots are big ammonia sources. So that's sort of the hardware part and the concentration part. Of course, concentrations alone don't tell you a lot. Uh, we really need to convert these into emissions. So I'll let uh, Kira Schonkweiler talk to you a little bit about that. Kira's a, um, a graduate student in atmospheric sciences at CSU. Well, hi. Um, yeah, Jake gave you some really great background on how uh, we're obtaining the concentration data as well as the, the um, environmental data. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank you all for sticking around, too, because <laughs> I know it's been a long day. Um, but yeah, so Jay, Jay gave you information about how, uh, what kind of data we've been collecting. And so knowing all of that, how can we back out emissions? Because we aren't really directly measuring emissions. Uh, so we use inverse modeling. And so we have our data sets, uh, the weather data, typically, you know, wind wind speed, wind direction, um, and then some other turbulent parameters uh, as well as stability parameters. And then we also have the concentration data uh, from the little radiellos. And remember, these are just usually one, one number for a two-week period, whereas the weather data is a time series. So uh, that seems kind of like there's something weird going on there because how do you compare the two, but I'll explain. And then we also know how uh, know the geometry and the roughness of our source area, so the feedlot. And if you take all of these three data sets and put them into an inverse model, you can back out emissions. And actually, what we've done is backed out what we've what we think are really good emissions based on just having one concentration data point every few weeks. Um, the inverse model that we use is called FIDES, and it stands for Flux Interpretation by Dispersion Exchange over Short Ranges. Um, it 
the way FIDES works is it uses um, the advection dispersion equation, which is kind of a classical fluid mechanics equation, um, and, it, and it solves it. So we know a bunch of, uh, a bunch of these um, variables already. Um, we know the concentration. That's what's coming off of the radiellos at those various sites. The background concentration, which, as Jay mentioned, is very small, usually less than 50 parts per billion. And then this um, is a dispersion function. And we know this because we know the source geometry, we know the turbulent conditions and all of the wind characteristics. And that just leaves the source strength, which is our emissions that we're looking for. So knowing all of that, um, we can use this model to get emissions estimates. Um, FIDES has been applied very successfully in Europe for the past 10 or so years. Um, and it was, it was uh, um, created in France. And the difference is that they were doing ammonia measurements that were a time series. Whereas, like I said, we've got a two-week period that's represented by a single concentration for each location. So this is the, really the first time that an inverse model has been used with time-averaged concentration data. So we kind of went into it like wanting to see what was going to happen if it, you know, do we even get close to the, to, to a good estimate. Um, so here's a similar picture to what Jay showed. This is a kind of our schematic of a feedlot. And that green arrow is the prevailing wind. Um, if the wind's coming from the other direction, we do get some data from that station labeled west. Uh, it's just kind of like the opposite. But these are our three main stations, north, base, and south. And I'll show you some data from that. Um, this is model output. So um, I put all those variables into the model. And these are, I essentially get a time series of emissions. But these all represent averages for that two-week period where I only have the one concentration point for each station. Um, and you could kind of see that it starts in October there and ends in early February. And there's a, a fairly distinguishable decrease uh, over, the, over the winter. Uh, that's mostly due to the decrease in temperature. But we still have really high ammonia concentrations and ammonia emissions. Because that green line there, that's, that top graph is temperature. The green line is this year. And the red line is the average, the 15-year the historical average. And we thought it was maybe wrong, because I think just before the talk, we were checking to make sure that that wasn't like the minimum temperature for Fort Morgan or whatever. And it's, it's right. <laughs> it's just been a very, very warm winter. Uh, below is, uh, shows just the average wind speed for each deployment period. Um, but yeah, the, there, we, we did get a lot higher ammonia emissions because of the higher temperatures. However, you did see that little decrease because there is a, a decrease in temperature, obviously. Um, I, don't, I think in, gen, in terms of that, it had more of an impact than the wind speed. But the wind speed definitely uh, plays a major role at times. So this is a histogram, uh, which is essentially just a frequency distribution of all of the emissions uh, from all of the data that I've ever run through FIDES. And uh, we have it, those emissions bins are essentially, I'll take all the data, and how many, how many uh, times does it fall in, in, an em in emissions between 0 and 40? How many times does it fall between you know, 40, 80, 80, and 120? Uh, and so you can definitely see that there's this log normal distribution and if you look at the values that fall between 40, 0 or 40 and 200 grams per head per day, that's about 90, 94% of all of the values um, of, the, of the emissions output that I've gotten from FIDES. Mm. And so this is kind of a summary, um, uh, more, I guess, bottom line summary. Um, you can see all of our deployment periods there. Most of them were about two weeks. Um, I think there was some periods where it was really cold, so we let it go another week or so. 
but uh, first of all, these are essentially just the emissions um, in, you know, per meter squared per day. Um, and on average, it was 4.7 for this data set. Um, this emissions factor uh, is pretty close to some of the literature. It's a bit smaller, but uh, it's still very good. Um, we didn't know what we were going to get, you know, coming out of this. And, and it seems pretty, pretty good, especially for a first try. And then um, really focusing on this percent fed nitrogen, uh, the, our average for this was 53%, and I think uh, Rick Todd had an average of 53% for his percent fed nitrogen. So it lines up really well with a lot of the literature that's out there. Um, so in conclusion, we saw that emissions decreased uh, as temperature decreased throughout the winter for our deployment periods, um, and that there's a log normal distribution to the model output. Um, we also saw that most of the values lied between 0 and 200 grams per head per day. And uh, the takeaway numbers are that our average em uh, emissions were 96.5 grams per head per day, 4.7 grams per meter squared per day, and the 53% of fed nitrogen that um, the cows got was emitted back to the air as ammonia. And then next steps, we're going to try and compare this to higher speed ammonia instrumentation. So we'll get an ammonia time series and then compare that to our time averaged um, radiello concentrations and see if we're getting, you know, really good emissions, you know, in, on average and then even on a daily, uh, on a daily um, period. So. That's about it. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. Do you know um, how long the manure patch had been there or how many cattle had been run across that patch? Oh, uh, the question was how long had the manure pack been there and or how many cattle had been running across the pack. We only measure we, we were really only um, measuring the closest pens. On that side, I I don't yeah. personally. You'll, you'll clean them maybe a sort of, you know, it's a it's a big commercial yard, it's about thirty thousand head. Uh, it was completely full. So, so there is there, another, yeah, if there's a way to have that another pack about it. Yeah. This is pretty preliminary. We're starting to put up uh, time-lapse photography on all our sites, uh, at all our sites, which is pretty interesting to watch. And uh, I was looking at uh, Jack's presentation where he's showing those pin surface conditions, and it made me want to go back and look at our time-lapse photography <laughs> and sort of character try to quantify our pin surface conditions. Which do you think's the most useful normalized number per square meter per day? Well, we're micrometeorologists, so we're going to say per square meter. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, but if you're an animal scientist, you say per head. Right? Well, well, I mean, again, yep. maybe per square meter, at least capture again and say, well, this typically mass feedlot is many square meters because mm -hmm. that could affect that. Yeah. yeah, and there's no reason mm -hmm. not to report both. right? Yeah, the, the straight model output is in nanograms per meter squared per second, but you could convert that from wherever. Yeah. <laughs> um, I believe it was 13% and there was 8.8% .8 nitrogen in the, in the feed, I think. Yeah, that's what you told me. Yeah, it was about, a, I think it was, yeah, just a little over 13%. For crude protein. For crude protein. Oh. Or 8.8 8 .8 grams, yeah, that's what. That's what I meant. <laughs> yeah. Can you send me the German send me the manure feed and the protein distribution to send them on the uh raw data edition um and then we would monitor the during mass like you can use the the variability of the sample to be able to uh, take the other uh different manure and then back to the uh 
I think it would it would depend, but yeah, you could. Um, as long as they were doing it maybe right in the middle or uh, of a of a deployment period. Um, I think that's the idea eventually is that you'll be able to see what the weather conditions are. Maybe that's your kind of your yeah. robotics grant. No, it's, it's real, it, it really shows up in the dairies where you can really see mm -hmm. like the emissions from the composting area and from the barns and from the, uh, you know. Uh, before we started deploying in October, I think it was just super dry. But while we had them deployed, there were quite a few major snowfall events. So I mean that if if yeah if if the if the wind speed and wind direction met the parameters of the conditional samplers, that that would have been something that we could have measured. But it, if the if the um, peak flux suddenly, you know, if it happened when when the samplers weren't meeting their criteria, then we probably would not have picked that up. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, we we uh, we talked to uh, Bill Hamrick and a lot of the a lot of the producers, like, and some of the 